Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our continuing study on the book of Revelation. For our theme song this morning, we're going to change up our procedure a little bit, and I'm going to invite each of you who would like to, to offer suggested songs that we use in this time slot. And to get us kicked off, we're using a song recommended by Brother Doug McDaniel. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there by the cathedrals. Well, now, everybody's going to have religion and glory. Everybody's going to be singing that story. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Oh, oh, hallelujah, brother. There's a reckoning in the coming in the morning. Better get your ready, call to give it you the morning. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Wonderful time up there. Now listen, everybody, cause I'm talking to you. Uh, Jesus is the only one to carry you through. Now you better get you ready, cause I'm telling you why. Uh, Jesus is coming from a soul on high. Uh, many are the weary and the lone and sad. They're going to wish they hadn't done the things they had. Uh, how you going to feel about the things he'll say on that judgment day? Everybody's going to have religion and gold. Everybody's going to be singing that story. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Oh, hallelujah, brother, there's a reckoning in the coming in the morning. Better to get your bed, go to give it in the morning. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. A wonderful time up there. Now listen here, my sister, we're not leaving you out. You may not be a preacher, but you sing and shout. What's the use to worry if you've been redeemed? Cause the heaven's even better than a miser dreamed. Think about the trouble you can save some soul. Tell them what to do to reach a shining goal. Surely you can show them how to find the light. And make the Everybody's gonna have a little bit glory. Everybody's gonna be singing that story. Everybody's gonna have a wonderful time up there. Oh, oh, hallelujah, brother. There's a reckoning in the coming of the morning. There's a get you there to go to give it to the morning. Everybody's gonna have a wonderful time up there. Now when the tribulations seem to darken the way, that's the time to get down on your knees and pray. Everybody's going to have the troubles too. You got to be so careful about the things you do. We're going down the valley, going one by one. We're going to be rewarded for the things that we've done. When we get to heaven in the promised land, then we'll understand. Everybody's going to have religion and glory. Everybody's going to be singing that story. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Oh, hallelujah, brother, there's a reckoning in the coming in the morning. Better to get your ready, go to give it to the warning. Everybody's going to have a wonderful time up there. Now you get your holy Bible in the back of the book. The book of Revelation, that's the place you must look. You can understand it and you can if you try. Jesus is the coming from his throne on high. Reading in the Bible all the things that he said. He said he was a coming back to raise the dead. Are you going to be among the chosen few? Will you make it through? Everybody gonna have a religion in glory. Everybody gonna be singing that story. Everybody gonna have a wonderful time up there. Brother, there's a reckoning in the coming in the morning. Better get you ready, cause I'm giving you the warning. Everybody's gonna have a wonderful time up there. We'll have a time, a wonderful time. We'll have a time up there. Everybody's gonna have a wonderful time up there. So as we begin in chapter 2, looking at the letters to the seven congregations in Asia, we're going to begin with just a real brief summary of the format that the letters follow. You will notice that in each of these seven letters, they will begin with Jesus giving a charge to John to write to the angel, the overseer, the messenger of the assembly at each of these different seven cities. He will identify himself as the visionary author and he will connect himself to that vision that we saw in chapter 1 when he first revealed himself to John on the Isle of Patmos. Then Jesus will make an appraisal. He will acknowledge the assembly's achievements, except in the case of Laodicea and Sardis where there simply were no achievements for him to acknowledge. He will offer words of encouragement, counsel, condemnation, warning, Actually, only Smyrna and Philadelphia escape the condemnation 
part of it. And then he will give a closing challenge to Shema, that is to hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregation. Shema is the Hebrew word for hear, and it implies more than just having sound pass through your ear into your brain. It implies hearing it with the intent of doing something about it, obeying, re reacting, responding. So here's a reading of the letter to the church in Ephesus. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. I am the one who holds the seven stars in my right hand. And I walk among the seven gold lampstands. Listen to what I say. I know everything you have done, including your hard work and how you have endured. I know you won't put up with anyone who is evil. When some people pretended to be apostles, you tested them and found out that they were liars. You have endured and gone through hard times because of me, and you have not given up. But I do have something against you, and it is this. You don't have as much love as you used to. Think about where you have fallen from, and then turn back, and do as you did at first. If you don't turn back, I will come and take away your lampstand. But there is one thing you are doing right. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing, and so do I. If you have ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will let everyone who wins the victory eat from the life-giving tree in God's wonderful garden. So the verse says, write this to the angel of the congregation in Ephesus. These are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among or in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. We already know, of course, that he has told us that the seven stars are the angels of the churches and the seven golden lampstands, menorahs, are the congregations themselves. Verse 2 says, I know what you have done, your hard labor and patience. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who passed themselves off as apostles but are not, and you have demonstrated them to be frauds and liars. You have patience, and you have put up with a great deal because of my name, and you haven't grown weary. What a wonderful commendation to begin this letter to this congregation in Ephesus. He says, I know. Actually, all seven of the letters begin with some form of I know. Uh, this reminds us that Jesus has perfect knowledge, and this knowledge is the basis of both perfect praise and perfect blame. It's not like you or me offering some compliment or like you or me making some word of commendation or of condemnation because we do it from our very inferior knowledge. And yet Jesus does it from all knowledge. There is no error in his judgment, both pro and con. He says that there are those who pass themselves off as apostles. Actually, Paul warned Ephesus about this in Acts 20 and verse 28. Some see this as evidence maybe that this was written before AD 70 simply because the idea of apostles, false or otherwise, kind of passes out of the literature of the early congregations um, after the destruction of Jerusalem. These people were purveyors of false doctrine, and they remind us of the fact that false doctrine, false apostles, can arise in any age, in any culture, on any continent. And... These people can label themselves as spokesmen for God when in fact they are quite the opposite. 
the false doctrine of the fake apostles uh, in Ephesus was not about worship style. It was not about traditions or preferences or dogma. It had rather to do with the very person and purpose of Jesus the Messiah. To the Jewish Christians, he wasn't Jewish enough. And they caused problems because that he didn't fit their mold. To the Gnostic Christians, he wasn't human enough. And they came up with some very unacceptable doctrine because they considered the flesh to be of no importance, no consequence, only the spirit matters. And therefore, whatever you chose to do of a fleshly nature had no bearing one way or the other. So go out and enjoy yourself. And that permeated the teaching of these false apostles, these false teachers in the first and second century. Being patient and not growing weary are part of the fundamental fabric of the message of the entire book of Revelation and certainly to this letter to the congregation in Ephesus. And it serves as a model to us today. We uh, often are very anxious. We are very tired of the way things are. We want things to be different. We want things to be our way. We want things to be easier. And the message that we hear from the letter to the Revelation churches is be patient. Be patient today, be patient tomorrow, and if necessary, be patient unto death. Verse 4 says, I do, however, have one thing against you. You have abandoned the love you showed at the beginning. King James Version uses the word, I have somewhat against you. That's not a very good translation for us today because somewhat kind of lessens the impact of it. It's not totally bad, but it's just somewhat bad. But that's not what Jesus is having John write. John is writing that there is something that is very serious, that is bad, that Jesus holds against that church at Ephesus. And that thing which he cannot tolerate is the fact that they have lost, abandoned, gotten away from the love that they began with, their first love. And actually it can have probably two different connotations. It can have a a meaning related to time. You used to have it, but you don't have it now. But it also carries the idea of you have lost the most important, the first in importance. You've let that slip away. And that thing is love. And it's agape love. It's God love. So remember the place from which you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at the beginning. If not, if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand out of its place. Let me introduce you to another word you may not be very familiar with. You know what orthodoxy is, likely. But do you know what orthopraxy is? The ecclesia needs to show both orthoplexy, orthoplexy, and orthodoxy. We should live the right way. That's orthoplexy. We should confess the right things. That's orthodoxy. I think that it's quite possible that what Jesus is saying to the church at Ephesus is, you have put so much emphasis on your orthodoxy you have been so focused on doctrinal purity and you have certainly not put up with false teachers. You have defended the, the gospel. You have defended the truth. But our first love has to be loving God and loving our neighbor the way that Jesus loved us. 
it seems that in the case of the Ephesian church, their focus on the orthodoxy, on doctrinal purity, had caused them or allowed them to become cold, suspicious, intolerant, and generally unattractive. And that is what Jesus is telling John to tell them, that you need to not abandon standing for the truth, certainly. I've already commended you for that. But don't let that be a hindrance or an excuse for you keeping your focus on the most important thing. Major in the majors, put first things first, and then everything will fall in place. And first things first is agape love. Not to turn a, a negative note, but for many years I have been very concerned. And perhaps this sounds judgmental on my part, and I don't have Jesus' perfect knowledge, so I don't intend to imply that I do. But I have observed in my fallible way that the Christian church in America has become very much a social institute. It exists primarily for the purpose of meeting the social needs of its practitioners. I know that that's a broad statement and certainly I have no right to judge anyone. But when we spend all of our money to satisfy our own personal wants and needs, when we spend all of our time to check off our boxes and make sure that our conscience is feeling good toward God, and we forget to love our neighbors as ourselves, when we forget to do our first works, the works that are most important to God, then our relevance becomes unimportant, and we run the risk of having Jesus remove the candlestick, which is us, as an organization, out of his presence. Notice that the cure, the repentance, he said, I want you to repent and do again those first things. And he explains what that cure is, what that repentance is. He says that involves doing the works that their first zeal had led them to do. I'll, I'll just conclude this by saying love doesn't feel, love doesn't say, love doesn't agree or disagree, Love does. Agape love is a verb. It's an action and it's a choice. And it is the first importance. Verse 6 says, You do, though, have this in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing. And I hate it too. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the sacred community. So, who in the world are the Nicolaitans? Much has been surmised, much has been written. Some of it is guesstimate, but some of it is rooted, it seems to me, with, into some fairly reliable sources. So let's dig into this a little bit today. First of all, he commends their stand against false teachers. And then he mentions the Nicolaitans. The, the word itself is, is an interesting word. Uh, in the Greek, it comes from Nikeo, to conquer, and laos, which simply means people. That's where we get our English word laity. And in verse 7, uh, when we get down to one of the later letters, um, we have the word Nikonti, which is to overcome, to be victorious, 
to conquer. Nicolaitanism is also a form of uh, an Arabic word, Aramaic word, and in its root it carries the idea of let's eat. And the idea behind that is permissiveness, the idea of let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. So let's do not restrict ourselves from anything that looks good to us. Let's be eaters. Anything physical is okay. And it carries very much the idea of Gnosticism, where the flesh is unimportant. So whatever we do in the flesh will be okay. There was a man named Nicholas from Syria, Antioch, who is mentioned in some of the secular literature as one who led many people into heresy. Various Roman authorities record that these followers of Nicholas were steeped in carnal sin on a rather massive scale. Surprisingly, some of the early church fathers, and we'll look at a few of these, held that this Nicholas was one of the seven deacons of Acts 6. Now there certainly was one of the deacons who was named Nicholas. Is it this one or was it somebody else? Well, I don't know, of course, but I do know that several of the early church fathers believed that he was. Bishop Seville wrote, the, Nicol the Nicolaitans are so called from Nicholas, deacon of the church of Jerusalem, who, along with Stephen and the others, was ordained by Peter. He abandoned his wife because of her beauty so that whoever wanted to might enjoy her. The practice turned into debauchery, with partners being exchanged in turn. Jesus condemns them in the apocalypse. So Seville is saying that this Nicholas, for whom the word Nicolaitans comes, was indeed one of the seven selected in Acts chapter 6. We'll get down to the Pergamum church uh, a little bit later on, not today, but later. And in that we will read, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. You remember Balaam, don't you? Balaam was the, the uh, man who had an argument with his donkey and the donkey won. Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice immorality. So, or thus, you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So in this next or next later letter to Pergamum, which we'll get to later on in chapter 2, we have the Nicolaitans being mentioned again. And here they are associated by metaphor with Balaam. And the accusations have to do with eating food sacrificed to idols and practicing immorality. So we're beginning to see a, a, a trend here, aren't we? Josephus writes that after Balaam failed to curse the Israelites, he counseled Balak to select the most desirable among their daughters and send them into the Israelite camp to seduce the Israelite soldiers to worship the gods of the Midianites and Moabites to make their god angry with them. So Josephus is saying that had Balaam succeeded, then they would have used immorality these uh, prostitutes to go in and tempt the soldiers of Israel, knowing that if they committed this sin with these uh, Midianite women, then God would turn his wrath against them and they would not be victorious. Both Peter in 2 Peter 2 and 15 and Jude in Jude verse 11 condemn some who have turned to walk in Balaam's way. So they also have that 
that connection with this metaphor. Eusebius writes, at this time the so-called sect of the Nicolaitans made its appearance and lasted for a very short time. Mention is made of it in the Apocalypse of John. They boasted that the author of their sect was Nicholas, one of the deacons who, with Stephen, were appointed by the apostles for the purpose of ministering to the poor. Clement of Alexandria wrote, They say that he, Nicholas, had a beautiful wife, and after the ascension of the Savior, being accused by the apostles of jealousy, he led her into their midst and gave permission to anyone that wished to marry her. For they say that this was in accordance with that saying of his, that one ought to abuse the flesh. And those that have followed his heresy, imitating blindly and foolishly that which was done and said, commit fornication without blame. And then Irenaeus writes, The Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas who was one of the seven first ordained to the deaconate by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. Then to Thyatira. We're down now to verse 18 of chapter 2. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. There seems to be a connection here between the terms that are used, between the metaphors of Balaam and Jezebel as representations of what the Nicolaitans are. So Balaam, Jezebel, Nicolaitans, food sacrifice to idols, unrestrained sexual immorality, all seem to be wrapped up in this idea of the Nicolaitans. Given that they are in the city of Ephesus with the temple of Artemis, with all of the terrible sexual immorality that's associated with that, uh, it's not unreasonable at all for us to understand how this can creep into even the sacred community. And that it is that the Ephesians were standing against and for which Jesus commended them. Now, some have theorized that the Nicolaitans were a group that sought to lord it over people. There was an issue of control and domination yet themselves living a permissive lifestyle under the banner of Christian freedom. In all of these that we have talked about, there seems to be this strong element of Gnosticism. And we know that Gnosticism was one of the major false teachings that John and Peter and, and uh, the other early church fathers and apostles uh, we're continually writing about and warning against and condemning. Then Revelation 2 and verse 7, the tree of life stands in God's paradise and I will give to anyone who conquers the right to eat from it. You remember from our video last week and if perchance you missed that video, I would urge you to go back and watch our class from last week. It's posted uh, on our church website and also on YouTube. Uh, there's just a wonderful video there about Ephesus as it existed in the day of John and how Jesus' letter to Ephesus ties in so directly to the physical characteristics and the spiritual and cultural characteristics of that city at that time. And he talked about, it. you will remember, he talked about there being this paradise uh, of the emperors and uh, there in the very place where the temple of Artemis was built, there was this tree that was holy and sacred to those pagan people. And that tree had the name of uh, the tree of life. And it was to give anyone who conquers anyone who uh, comes to it and pays homage there, um, it was to represent uh, a place of refuge and a place of 
of salvation. We, of course, first come in contact with the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And uh, Adam and Eve have access to that tree until they sin. And the tree is removed then, or they are taken away from the tree. And then we see it again when we get to the last part of the book of Revelation, where John sees the tree of life, well, actually the trees of life, because they're lining both sides of the river flowing from the throne of God. And here in the middle of that, we have the temple of Artemis in Ephesus in this paradise with the pagan tree of life. And Jesus is looking at that tree that's going to die and that holds forth a false promise and says, you hang in there with me and I'm going to give you your own paradise, the paradise of God. And in that paradise, you will have access to the tree of life, which truly does give everlasting life. And that's the ending of the writing to the church at Ephesus. And that will bring us now to the church in Smyrna. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. I am the first and the last. I died but now I am alive. Listen to what I say. I know how much you suffer and how poor you are, but you are rich. I also know the cruel things being said about you by people who claim to be Jews. But they are not really Jews. They are a group that belongs to Satan. Don't worry about what you will suffer. The devil will throw some of you into jail and you will be tested and made to suffer for 10 days. But if you are faithful until you die, I will reward you with a glorious life. If you have ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever wins the victory will not be hurt by the second death. So right now we're going to call in Joe Stowell again. He is the president of Cornerstone University and he is the gentleman that led us on the wonderful tour through Ephesus last week. And he will now be taking us on a journey through Smyrna. And we hope to be using him throughout these seven different letters to the seven churches. He does such a marvelous job of really putting everything into its historic cultural significance and relating it directly to the writings of Jesus through John to these different sacred communities. So we'll see about half of it today and then we'll pick up the other half uh, in our introduction next week, Lord willing, and before we go on into the text concerning Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We're standing amongst the ruins of ancient Smyrna, which as you can see is tucked right into the middle of the thriving Turkish city of Izmir. But Smyrna in its day was a thriving city as well. In fact, Smyrna was known as one of the finest seaports in the world. Uh, if you were to take a straight line west from Smyrna, it was the closest seaport to Europe. In fact, you'd end up right in Athens, the gateway to the rest of Europe. So Smyrna was an important city in its day. Smyrna was known for its beauty and its architecture and its gorgeous flowers in this almost tropical climate. But Smyrna was known for something else. 
Uh, its citizens took pride in its history. In 600 BC, the Lydian king Attalus conquered Smyrna and actually devastated it, left it as a humble, tiny village. And then when Alexander the Great came through here, in a dream he had a vision to rebuild Smyrna and rebuilt it into one of the most spectacular cities of its day. So the folklore and all of its literature was filled with references to death and resurrection. That we are the city who once was dead and have now come to life. And it's that theme that Jesus Christ picks up on when he writes his letter to early Christians suffering in this city. This claim to fame that Smyrna was that city that once was dead but has been resurrected now to a far better life was underscored by their major commodity. Smyrna held the exclusive rights to the import and export of the valued fragrant spice called myrrh. Actually, hence their name, Smyrna. Myrrh was not only valued for its fragrance, but it was valued for its use in burial procedures. In fact, they sold just countless amounts of myrrh to Egypt, when the embalming process was to preserve the body for its right to the afterlife, and myrrh was a very key ingredient. You know, I wonder if when the wise men came to celebrate the birth of Christ, that the frankincense and myrrh that they brought I wonder if that came from Smyrna. And I think too of the death of Christ, where they wrapped him and anointed him with myrrh. That probably came from Smyrna as well. So no wonder Jesus camps on this theme, that early Christians who just may face death for him would be resurrected to a far better life. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Jesus opens his letter by saying, I am the first and the last, the one who has died and risen again. And then he says to them, I know your tribulation. Interesting how all of the letters begin with that phrase, I know. In Revelation chapter 1, in John's vision, Christ is seen as walking amongst the lampstands, saying that he is present with the churches. But he's not just present, he's intensely aware of what they're dealing with. And he says, I know what tribulation you're under. The word tribulation there is the word for an ancient torture where they would take the victim and lie him on his back and then put weights on his chest, one upon another upon another until those weights began to crush and make it so he couldn't breathe anymore. What a vivid picture. Jesus recognizes three weights on the chest of this church. Number one, their poverty. Number two, they're slandered as a subculture by the Jews in this town. And number three, he predicts that they will face imprisonment and even death. It's kind of a foreboding warning, I would say. But at the end of the letter, he encourages them to persevere. Let's think about that challenge, that weight of their poverty. Taking a stand for Jesus Christ in the Roman Empire, and particularly here in Smyrna, often meant being cast into an impoverished state. Um, you may lose your job. You'd certainly be kicked out of the trade unions because you wouldn't worship the gods of the trade unions. Uh, you're such a despised minority that even if you set up a little kiosk somewhere to sell your wares, that who'd want to buy from Christians? So Jesus says to the believers in Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty. But then he does something interesting, parentheses. He says, but you are rich. Fascinating. It's all in the definitions, isn't it? You know, we think being truly rich is to have a big stack of stuff and a huge bank account, <laughs> God says that's not true riches. And he says that in their poverty they're rich. 
It reminds me of my all-time favorite story about Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, when he's walking through the crowd, and there's a man in the crowd who catches the eyes of Christ, and what a privilege. Now Jesus, this magnet rabbi, looks at him, and he gets to talk to him. And he says to Jesus, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know, I'm thinking, like, if you get one shot at Jesus, that's probably not a good thing to say. I think if I had one shot at him, I'd want to say something so profound that he would say, hmm, I never thought of that. <laughs> Let's have dinner and talk it over. But Jesus responded to the man in the crowd by making an amazing statement. He said, take heed and beware of greed, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Think that through. So counterculture that our lives do not consist of earthly riches. Then he told the story of a rich fool who had so much that he had to tear down his barns and build bigger barns through a party for himself, and God showed up and said, this night thy soul shall be required of you. And he wasn't a fool because he had a lot of stuff. Jesus said he was a fool because he was not rich toward God. I think the believers in Smyrna were rich toward God, though they were in poverty. Of course, being impoverished because one doesn't deny the name of Jesus Christ was not limited just to the believers at Smyrna. In fact, throughout all of history, that's often been the case. In our own lifetime, believers in Russia were marginalized and impoverished as a church. I remember being in Russia with a friend of mine who was a pastor of a little local assembly. And he said to me one day, hey, let's go visit my mom. So we climbed in the van and we drove about an hour and drove off the main highway down a smaller road, then onto a dirt road, and a couple miles back that dirt road was this little shanty town, little huts almost. He pulled up in front of one of them, and his mom, who was a widow, came running out to see us in her babushka, reddened face, smiling and rejoicing. I thought it was to see my friend Victor. But as we walked into her little house that only had two rooms, um, I walked by the garden that she had planted and noticed she had a pig in the sty over there. And I said, oh, your mom's got a pig. He said, yep. She raises that in the summer and eats it in the winter. This woman had nothing. And we went in and sat down around a little primitive table and she served us some vegetables. And she was just beaming. And all she could talk about wasn't Victor, <laughs> about Jesus and about how much she loved him and how much he meant to her and how she couldn't wait to get to heaven, to be with him forever. I kind of felt so convicted. You know, here, like most of us, I have a lot. You know, affluence has just filled up my cup. And here this woman had nothing, but I thought she's got everything. And I thought, all she had was Jesus. <laughs> and that made her truly rich. And that was like the believers in Smyrna. All they had was Jesus but that made them truly rich. And then I thought, I have so much that there are times I wonder if I need Jesus. And that makes me truly poor. So when Jesus said to the believers in Smyrna, you are poor, but you are rich, what a wonderful statement and what a wonderful lesson for us to learn. Okay, so I hope you're enjoying him as much as I am. I, I think he really brings these writings to life in a very special way. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing his further teachings with us in, in all of these different seven churches. Hope you have a wonderful, God-blessed week. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. God bless.